Her life was a fairy tale. I walked into Celeste's closet and there was a thousand pair of shoes. It was unbelievable. She had a rich husband. Stephen Beer gave her everything. He, he literally gave her millions. Two beautiful daughters and loyal friends. I felt a kinship with her, if I could talk to her. But for Celeste Beard, it wasn't enough. And she'd do anything to get more. Insatiable greed, a lesbian love triangle, betrayal, and murder next on Snap. Celeste Johnson had always wanted more from life than what her surroundings had to offer. Born in 1963 in Camarillo, California, she got pregnant as a teenager and married her boyfriend, Craig Bratcher. On February 6, 1981, she gave birth to twin girls, Jennifer and Christina. But her marriage was far from happy. Her husband was into drugs and hadn't drank yet. And became abusive. Facing a grim future, Celeste left Craig and her seven-year-old daughters behind, but vowed that one day she'd get them back. A person like her probably saw herself as this really good mother who, instead of abandoning her daughters, she probably saw herself as going out on a mission, something exciting, where she was going to, you know, go out and find somebody to help her get the kids back, preferably somebody who had money or power. And preferably someone with both. For the next few years, she drifted from town to town, never giving up hope of finding her Prince Charming. In the spring of 1993, she took a job at the Austin Country Club. What people don't realize about some women like Celeste is that they premeditate um, things. If you're looking for a man who has power and status, the best place to go is where the old money is. The men of the Austin Country Club took note of the attractive new hire. One of them was 68-year-old millionaire media tycoon Steve Beard. Stephen Beard was a, uh, was a self-made financial wizard. He founded uh, a television station. When he sold the rumor around was that he got $15 million for it. Steve, as I've told everybody, uh, was more like Jackie Gleason than anybody I've ever met. Really outgoing, very, very funny. But recently, Beard's personal life had taken a tragic turn. His wife of 50 years had passed away, a victim of terminal brain cancer. He was a lonely man. I've had one person tell me that just before his wife Elise died, he said, what am I going to do? Who's going to take care of me? When Steve and Celeste met, it seemed like it was meant to be. Despite the age difference, they hit it off immediately. But with his wife's death still so recent, he wanted to keep his new relationship a secret. So Celeste moved into the Beard Mansion as a housekeeper. The way I found out that Celeste and Dad were more than just housekeeper and, you know, was when the uh, 93 Super Bowl was happening. And I called the hotel and um, I asked for my father's room. And she answered the phone. And that's when it hit me that obviously what is the housekeeper doing at the Super Bowl in my father's room? Once the relationship became public, Steve Beard treated Celeste like royalty. They would go out to dinner and laugh and just just be that May December relationship that we all dream of. I think he liked the idea of having someone young and pretty and vivacious around him. And she was somebody who had never had financial security in her life and wanted that for herself. Celeste had found her knight in shining armor, but there were two more damsels in distress who needed rescuing, her daughters. By July 1996, thanks to Celeste's perseverance and Steve's money, 
both girls were now living with their mother. Celeste had everything she wanted in life from Steve. It was like she turned into a princess. Then on February 8th, 1995, the princess became a queen. A fact that didn't exactly please Steve's daughter. I went to the wedding to support my father. And I vowed that the whole time that I was there, that I would not speak to Celeste at all. Many of Steve's friends felt the same way. Where Steve saw the new love of his life, they saw a heartless gold digger. I could just tell Celeste, I looked at her eyes and I wrote like dollar signs under in the whites of her eyes. And I said, this is a big, big mistake. If Celeste felt the cold breeze blowing in from the groom side, it didn't seem to bother her. After the wedding, she and her daughter stepped into a dream. I don't believe that any teenager in the world today goes from what they had previous to what they had after this marriage took place. Celeste would buy a new Cadillac the way I would buy a Reese's peanut butter cup on the way out of the supermarket. I walked into Celeste's closet and there was a thousand pair of shoes, maybe 800. I, it was unbelievable. Uh, now the markets didn't have anything on Celeste. In fact, shopping had become more than just an activity for Celeste. It became an obsession, even an addiction. That just became a new vice for me. Um, when I was depressed or upset, you know, I'd go shopping. Many people who are afraid to be alone, uh, they feel empty and they feel anxious, and going out shopping was probably a way to sort of get rid of those feelings of emptiness and loneliness. The shopping may have been, but the aftermath wasn't. As Celeste's spending spiraled out of control, Steve threatened divorce. In response, Celeste threatened suicide. It was a threat that got her admitted to St. David's psychiatric facility. There, Steve hoped she could work through her addiction. At the very least, he thought the break would do their marriage a world of good. Oh, how wrong he would turn out to be. At St. David's, Celeste met fellow patient Tracy Tarleton. I felt a kinship with her. If I could talk to her and not feel bad or feel like somebody wouldn't understand what I was talking about. The two women's bond was immediate and intense. But was it more than a friendship? It was as far as Tracy was concerned. Tracy has never made any bones about the fact that she is a lesbian, that she likes women. Tracy believed that Celeste was also at least a bisexual and someone who had a lesbian love for Tracy. She probably looked at Celeste and saw somebody who maybe cared about her, who would do things with her, and who could understand her on an emotional level. Whether Celeste and Tracy were involved in a lesbian affair or not, the relationship seemed to help them both. In April of 1999, the two women were discharged. But they stayed in touch. They would um, go shopping together. They went to parties together and I guess went to, to some lunches or dinners. In the spring of 1999, Celeste's life looked brighter than a new Cadillac. She was back together with her husband and daughters, and she had a new best friend. One with whom she could share her innermost secrets. A friend she could trust with anything. But as it turned out, the two women were sharing a shocking secret. One that had nothing to do with the lesbian affair and everything to do with murder. In April of 1999, Celeste Beard and Tracy Charlton had just been discharged from St. David's psychiatric facility, but they maintained their friendship. The fact that they're both in, a, in an institution, that kind of brings people together. But rumors swirled that the two women were more than just friends. You have people who supposedly saw Celeste and Tracy kissing passionately. One thing was certain, 
Celeste's ability to confide in Tracy apparently helped her curb her spending habits and helped save her marriage. The Beard family was once again on stable ground. But all that changed on October 2nd, 1999. At 2.57 a.m., emergency dispatchers received a bizarre 911 call. Hello? Hello? Do you need an ambulance? I need an ambulance. Where are you? The call came in from 3900 Toro Canyon Road. The caller was Steve Beard. What is the phone number you're calling? Oh my God, it just came out of my stomach. Sergeant Greg Truitt responded to the call. Mr. Beard was holding his hand over, over his stomach and there were, you could see intestines or whatever protruding up between his fingers. At first, Truitt didn't know what to make of the scene. Then he found one clue that would blow the case wide open. He was a rather large man, so I just assumed that maybe some stitches had uh, come loose or something like that. Uh, but a deputy came out from the road and informed me that a shotgun shell had been located in the investigation. I mean, changed 180 degrees. EMTs quickly airlifted Steve Beard to Brackenridge Hospital for emergency surgery. Meanwhile, detectives began processing the crime scene. There were some drawers pulled out. There were some items laying around. But my initial impression of it was that it did not appear to be a burglary. In a separate wing of the house, detectives found Celeste and her daughter, Christina. Both were sound asleep. She immediately started uh, screaming and uh, kind of got hysterical there for a few minutes, uh, saying, don't let him die, don't let him die. That's all I could think about, is don't let him die. I just, I didn't think about anything else, who could have done it, why, or anything, except don't let Stephen die. Celeste may not have been thinking about who shot her husband, but the cops were. On the suggestion of Christina, they paid a visit to Tracy Tarleton. One of the first things they ask her is, do you have a shotgun? She gives them the shotgun, gives them permission to take the shotgun, and they quickly realize that that shotgun is the one used to fire the shell uh, casing that they have recovered there. Tracy admitted she had shot Steve Beard. But why would she want to shoot Steve Beard? Her reactions to all this is, is not right. Something is, is eating at her, and at the same time, it's not allowing her to tell us what we need to know. My whole thought from the very beginning was, why would Tracy Tarleton want to shoot my father in the first place? Police, too, had suspicions that someone else was involved in the shooting, but Tracy refused to talk. So they booked her on the charge of felony injury to an elderly person and tossed her in the county lockup. Uncovering the mystery behind Steve's shooting would reveal a sickening tangle of sex, love, manipulation, and murder. On February 17th, Steve Beard was released from Brackenridge Hospital and placed in the custody and care of his dutiful wife. She cleaned and cared for his wound almost hourly, kept visitors to an absolute minimum, and forbid the cops from questioning him. She went and hired a criminal defense attorney uh, the same day that the police were beginning their investigation. She refused to allow the police to talk to her husband. But then tragedy struck. Less than a week after being released, Steve died from a staph infection in his gunshot wound. And my secretary called and said, Steve is dead. And I went, there is no way on earth. I just saw him two weeks ago. He was in the best mood. He was walking around, he had his strength back. Steve's death also put the heat on Tracy Tarleton. Now, instead of felony injury, she was staring straight down the barrel of a murder charge, but she still refused to talk. I asked her specific questions as to where she was the night of the, the shooting, of what her specific relationship with Celeste was, but she would give answers that were more or less open-ended. While Tracy sat in prison stonewalling police, Celeste hit the town shutting up eligible bachelors. 
Before long, she had found another husband, a handsome young bartender named Spencer Cole Johnson. She had the older man with money, and now she's going to go back to the younger man who has sex. Just another way to fulfill whatever desire she has. I think she waited five months. The heart came real quickly. For some people, maybe. But news of Celeste's marriage would soon find its way to an old friend. The newlywed would learn that betrayal cuts both ways. And the cut can be deep and bloody. On July 3rd, 2000, Celeste Beard remarried less than six months after the shocking murder of her husband. With an inheritance in the millions and a strapping young husband, everything seemed to once again be going Celeste's way. Until Tracy Tarleton happened to be reading the newspaper in her cell at the Travis County Jail and spotted something interesting. Celeste's wedding announcement. Tracy Tarleton, all of a sudden, she realizes, I have been so duped. And that's when she decided not only she says not only to clear her own name, but she suddenly starts to identify with Stephen Beard, feeling like he wasn't the only victim here. For months, the cops hadn't been able to get Tracy to tell them a thing. Now, they couldn't shut her up. According to Tracy, Steve and Celeste's relationship wasn't exactly based on true love. She had a sexual schedule with Mr. Beard. She would expect things in exchange for that, the material things. She used sex as a bargaining tool. There was a Sunday suck day. Steve said Celeste gave him the best oral sex he'd ever had in his life. And Tracy told police, Celeste had a foolproof way of making sure her husband was asleep by 8 p.m., giving her plenty of time for nightly spending sprees. She would substitute Everclear for vodka, because Steve drank vodka every night, and that with the combination of the drugs she was giving him um, would cause him to go to sleep or pass out. If what Tracy was claiming was true, it would certainly make Celeste a manipulative bitch. But that's not illegal, even in Texas. Attempted murder is, though. And Tracy claimed that in August of 1999, Celeste had cooked up a plan to put her husband to sleep for good. She gets a recipe book for botulism and supposedly cooks up some botulism by taking a lot of ground meat and sticking it, you know, in the sun. And supposedly they then made some chili with this and Celeste put it on Steve's chili dog. He ate it up and said it was just delicious. And she was real frustrated because he did not get sick at all. A couple of months after the botched botulism plan, Tracy claimed Celeste came to her again. And this time Celeste was desperate. According to Tracy, Celeste couldn't take it anymore. Steve had to die or she would. Celeste had convinced Tracy that if Celeste remained with Stephen Beard, Celeste would kill herself. That if she tried to leave Stephen Beard, then Stephen Beard would harm Celeste. That if she didn't do anything, she was going to completely lose Celeste. The two of them had crafted a plan. Tracy was going to shoot Stephen in the stomach while he was sleeping, and Celeste was going to come in, pick up the shotgun shell, and play it off as a robbery. The plan worked, eventually, but Tracy didn't kill him. Celeste did. According to Tracy, Steve's staph infection was no accident. Celeste killed Steve Beard with her hands. Celeste, when she would change the words, would go out and get her hands muddy, would uh, get all the dirt on her hands. She was putting everything she could to infect the wound, and he got a staph infection, and that's what killed him. In exchange for a promise to testify against Celeste, prosecutors cut Tracy's sentence to 20 years with the possibility of parole in 10. But they threw an entire shopping cart of charges at Celeste, including the big one, 
conspiracy to commit capital murder. The charge carried the potential for a death sentence. On February 3rd, 2003, Celeste Beard Johnson's murder trial began. Prosecutors began by telling the jury that Celeste had killed her husband for one reason and one reason only, money. It was pure greed and selfishness. She's somebody who married him because she loved money. Prosecutors began by laying out the evidence they had against her. Then they called Tracy to the stand. Tracy was very, very believable. She did not try to sugarcoat or minimize her involvement in the shooting. She admitted everything she did and was just real credible and sincere. Despite the fact that Tracy had shot Steve Beard in cold blood, the prosecution was counting on the jury to sympathize with her, to believe that she had been manipulated by Celeste into pulling the trigger. What the research finds is that women typically are much more into emotional types of relationships. So a woman um, can get very attached emotionally. And Tracy probably was the type of person who, um, when they were sexually active, did get very emotionally involved with Celeste. And Celeste perhaps was using sex to manipulate Tracy. But Celeste had made a mockery of that relationship when she married Cole Johnson. And to drive the point home, the prosecution put Celeste's own children on the stand to testify to the mother's manipulative ways. The 22-year-old's testimony was damning. You rarely see cases where children will come in and say something against their parents. The fact that these two articulate young women were willing to come in and give the jurors a virtual laundry list of bad acts that Celeste Beard had committed I guess Mr. Beard had a, a huge impact on the jury. Celeste's fate was sealed. On March 19th, the jury found Celeste Beard Johnson guilty of capital murder. She was sentenced to life in prison. Even so, Celeste has no plans of admitting any culpability in Steve Beard's death. I will never apologize for Stephen's murder when I had nothing to do with it. And I just hope that Dick wins my appeal because I know in my heart that if we get a second chance at a trial, that I'll be found not guilty. Ironically, Tracy and Celeste are again close, physically anyway. Tracy's at Gatesville Women's Prison and Celeste is a half mile down the road at Mountain View. Despite the proximity, the two have no contact with each other. And the same is true for Celeste and her daughters. I want to call them the Menendez sisters. It just um, it breaks my heart that the two people I love more than anything in this world would do this to me. There is, of course, plenty of betrayal to go around in this case. But it's pretty hard to feel sorry for Celeste Beard. She had everything she could possibly have wanted in life. And in the end, it wasn't enough. What's unusual about that in this particular case is the degree of greed. Uh, Stephen Beer gave her everything. He, he literally gave her millions. And that wasn't enough for her. And Tracy Tarleton gave her everything that Tracy could give, which was primarily love. Uh, and that wasn't enough for Celeste Beard. And I'm not sure anything would have ever been enough. <laughs>